Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Carlton Byrd, privileged to serve as the president of the Southwest Region Conference. Welcome to Experience the Word. Through our episode tonight, you are going to experience God in a very real way as you experience his word through the preach word and the sung word. So you know what time it is. Call your neighbors, family members, and friends. Text them. Send them a social media post and encourage them to join us right now as we experience the word. Also, I'd like to wish everyone happy holidays. During this season, I'm pleased to announce that the Southwest Region Conference Christmas television special, Come Adore Him, will be aired on NBC television affiliates across the United States on Christmas Day, December 25th. Yours truly will preach the word of God, and our special musical guests include Jonathan McReynolds, Naomi Rain of Maverick City Music, and also our 500 voice children's choir under the direction of Gail Jones Murphy. Be sure to visit our website at southwestregionsda.org for broadcast times in your area. Well, it's that time, time to experience the word as we are blessed, as God speaks to us through his word and through music ministry. Naaman the leper went down into the Jordan seven times. He came up shouting, oh Lord, I see the change. Naaman the to the Jordan seven times he came up shouting oh Lord I see the change well if you don't know what a leper is I want you to lend an ear open up the pages of your mind and I'll paint a picture clear there were sores on Naaman's body Soars from limb to limb. Well, he'd seen many a doctor, but there was no hope for him until one day a little servant girl said, Master, good news. Well, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows what to do for you. So she took him down to the prophet. Shouting, oh Lord, I see the change. Well, he went on down in the Jordan two times and then again. Well, he began to wonder as he looked down at his skin. There were plenty of rivers in his homeland where the waters were crystal clear. And he wondered why the prophet had to send him way over here. So he dipped down for the fourth time, started to go back home. When a voice called out to him, Naaman, hold on, there's no power in that water, Naaman, not in that muddy spring. You see the power. times he came up shouting oh lord i see the change well he went on down in the jordan for the fifth time and again his body was aching and it ached a whole lot more there were six times in the jordan Six times so strange 
Six times he looked at himself and six times no change. Well, I know he must have wondered somewhere back in his mind that he'd be free from the dread. Take your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. I preach this text all the time, but God has given me some new nuggets uh, from it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're just going to read verses 15, 16, 17, and 18. Let's stand for the reading of the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 15, 16, 17, and 18. The Word of God says, See that none render evil for what everybody unto any man, but ever follow that which is what? Come on, ever follow that which is what, everybody? Good, both among yourselves and to all men. Verse 16, rejoice what? Evermore. Seven, verse 17, pray without what? And then verse 18, in everything, give what? Thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Father, we ask that you bless us now. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Make us modus, fill us, Jesus. Fall afresh on us, God. When the appeal is made, move by your power, sprinkle out, sprinkle out your grace. Hide behind your cross. Forgive us of our sins. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone say amen. You may be seated. Give thanks. Everybody say give thanks. Say it like you mean it. Say give thanks. All right. You worship out of your experience. Let me say that again. You worship out of your experience. Because the only way to truly worship God is out of what you've been through. You can tell somebody else's testimony, but it's not your testimony. You can preach somebody else's sermon but it's not your sermon. You can pretend to carry on saying amen, clapping your hands, shouting hallelujah, like you see somebody else carrying on, saying amen, clapping their hands, shouting hallelujah, but if it's not been out of your experience, then it's fake, false, phony, and untrue. But somebody knows when God's been really good to you. When it's God has brought you through something, you worship and, you wor and your worship takes on a different type of flavor. It takes on a different type of turn. It goes to a new level because your worship is not repetition. It's not just routine. It's no longer habit. It's no longer just showing up because now that you know why, you get excited about how. Because for every great why, there has to be a great how. I know why I worship God. But Paul in the text teaches us how to worship God. He tells us how to praise God, how to thank God. He tells us the how in the text. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul gives us eight principles on how Christians ought to worship God. Now, I wish I had all the time in the world for eight, but I only have time for four. 
Somebody, that was your cue. Preacher, Pastor Bird, don't worry about it, but uh, you missed your cue. So let me get on it quickly. First now, verse 15. Don't render evil for evil unto anyone. In other words, you can't live the Christian mentality based on the payback mentality. You can't go around trying to get even with folk who have wronged you. Two wrongs never make a right. If you kick my dog, that does not mean I can kick your cat. Christianity is not based on an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth because an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth will leave somebody snaggle tooth and blind. Do I have a witness in this place? If you're a follower of Christ, you must return good for evil. Don't come to church to worship God trying to get back at somebody for what somebody did to you. Talking about they didn't speak to me, so I'm not going to speak to them. They didn't greet me, so I'm not going to greet them. They didn't vote for me to be a deacon, so I'm not going to vote for them to be a deaconess. They didn't let my child sing, so I'm not going to let their child usher. No, don't render evil for what, everybody? Evil. Number two, I'm moving quick. Paul says, rejoice evermore. Everybody say rejoice. All right, let me keep it real, and I can say this. I don't know about you, but I don't have time for a church that won't let me rejoice. As I get older, I refuse to be a prisoner in my own church. When I come to church, I come to rejoice. When I come to church, I come to praise the Lord. This is not the frozen chosen or the first church of refrigeration. But when I come to church, I come to lift my hands and bless him. I come to praise the Lord. I don't come to church for foolishness. I did not wake up at 2 o'clock this morning to come to church for foolishness. I don't come for mess. I don't come for somberness. I don't come for negativity. I don't come for defeatism, despondency, or despair because you can get enough of that during the week. When I come to church, I come to rejoice. This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I come to praise the name of Jesus. I come to lift the name of Jesus. I come to magnify the name of Jesus. Because if God's been good to you, you ought to say something. If God has blessed you, you ought to say something. If God has been your bridge over troubled waters, you ought to say something. If God has helped you raise those children by yourself, you ought to say something. If God has kept you, if he's delivered you, if he's raised you, if he's redeemed you, if he's rescued you, you ought to say something. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Rejoice evermore. You see, some of us sit in service all day long, never smile, never sing, never pat a foot, never moan, never groan, never say amen, never do anything. I'll be real, I couldn't go anywhere three hours and do nothing. Paul says rejoice. He says what, everybody? And be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. God desires that his people be joyful. As Christians, we ought to be the happiest people in the world. Christians shouldn't have long faces. Christians shouldn't have mean dispositions. Christians shouldn't have cruel characters. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, come and magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. His mercy endureth forever. Rejoice evermore. And you can't rejoice without joy. All right, let me say it again because somebody didn't get it. You still got rocks in your jaws, still trying to mean mug me. Let me try it this way. You can't rejoice without joy. Everybody say joy. And notice I said joy and not happiness. Because there's a difference between the two. I wish I had a witness in this place. Happiness is contingent upon what's happening. But joy is in spite of <laughs> what's happening. Do I have a witness in this place? 
I praise God not because of, but I praise God in spite of. When we talk about joy, joy is something that is internal and based on a revelation. Joy is not external like happiness. But joy is internal based upon a revelation. And when I know who God is, when I know what God has done in my life, it doesn't make a difference what happens on the outside. But it's all about what I know and who I know on the inside. So today I'm not talking about happiness. Today I'm talking about joy. I'm not talking about that thing that is motivated by some external stimuli. But I'm talking about something that happens on the inside. All right, let me break it down. Somebody's still not getting it. When somebody gives you flowers, you're happy. When someone tells you you sang well, you're happy. When someone tells you you preach well, you're happy. When someone takes you out on a date and pays for it, you show enough happy. But there's a distinction between happiness and joy. Joy is not based on some external reality. Joy is based on an internal revelation because if nobody takes me out, I'll take my own self out. If nobody irons my shirt, I'll iron my own shirt. I'll polish my own shoes. I'll pat my own self on the back because sometimes you've got to encourage yourself in the Lord. It doesn't make a difference when you have joy what the doctor says. Because when you have joy, you're able to say, doctor, I appreciate your prognosis. I appreciate your diagnosis, but I've got joy because I know what God's word says. I've got a revelation on the inside. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him, but by his stripes I'm healed. Let me tell y'all something. The devil can take what he wants, but he can't take my joy. This joy I have, y'all didn't give it, and y'all can't take it away either. I wish I had a witness in this place. My joy is not based on some external stimuli, but my joy is based on an internal reality. Happiness comes and goes, but joy shows in your facial expressions. Joy shows in your handshake. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. It doesn't matter what people are saying to you, doing to you, or acting towards you. You can still have joy. I woke up this morning with joy. I don't come to church to spectate. I'm making up a word. Because real worship is not a spectator sport. But I come to church to participate. I come to lift my voice. I come to raise my hands. I come to clap my hands. I come to stomp my feet. Because this may just be the last time I can do it. So rejoice evermore. Always rejoice. Always be excited. Always be enthusiastic. Always full of joy. Rejoice evermore. Number three, I'm almost getting there. I only have four. Paul says pray without what? Cease. That means y'all pray continually. If there's something that life has taught me at 51 years old, it has taught me how to pray. I wish I had a witness in this place. Somebody knows that when you're a child of God, you will learn to pray. And you will keep on praying. There should be a constant spirit of prayer breathing through the Christian's life. Prayer is not limited to prescribed hours, but should be a constant element in our daily lives. Let me remind someone today, the devil is always busy. When you're asleep, the devil is busy. When you're awake, the devil is busy. When you think you're at your spiritual best, the devil is busy. When you're at your spiritual worst, the devil is busy. When you got your guard up, the devil is busy. When you got your guard down, the devil is busy. The bottom line is the devil is busy. The devil's never satisfied for peace to prevail. He's the author of confusion, and whenever we, he can get a foot in, he will. That's why Paul says pray without what? Ceasing. That means don't ever stop praying. Where there's much prayer, there's much power. Where there's little prayer, there's little power. Where there's no prayer, there's no power. I still believe it. Prayer still changes things. Prayer still changes people. So pray for your family. Pray for the church. Pray for the elders. Pray for the deacons. Pray for the deaconesses. Pray for the ones sitting next to you. And God knows, please pray for me. And while you're saying amen to pray for me, pray for yourself. How about that, everybody? All right, number four. I'm almost done. Fourth and finally. Paul says, but I'm going to spend some time on this. <laughs> Paul says, in everything, give what everybody? Thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, y'all know I used to say I'm an old man in a young body. But now that I've crossed 50, <laughs> Naomi, I can't say that anymore. But I, I used to always say I'm an old man in a young body. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when I was a child, listen to me good. 
because there's still some old school parenting that was good and still is good. When I was a child, I was taught to say thank you. So somebody, well, why are you thanking Evan and why are you thanking the deacon and the elder and, and Adam? Because when I was a child, I was taught to say thank you. I need to preach a sermon on customer service. All right, so you voted. I will give you what you want. Come on, say amen. All right. But when I was a child, I was taught to say thank you. When someone did something for you, you said thank you. And if you didn't say thank you, it was a reflection on your upbringing and your home training. Do I have a witness in this place? All right. Some of you knew my dad. I mean, Brother Shelton knew my dad. All right, my dad was a no-nonsense dude. All right, and my dad didn't believe in being embarrassed. Okay, when he was the preacher, Elder Walker, and he would preach, my family and I would sit on the second row. I have never in church sat anywhere I wanted to in church. <laughs> my mother would sit on the second row right there, and my brother, sister, and I, in age order, would sit next to her every Sabbath. And if we acted up in church, all he had to do was give that look. And it was painful because you knew between the time he finished his sermon and the time you got home, you were going to get a whooping. I wish I had a witness in this place. So because he didn't believe in being embarrassed, I had better say thank you in response to people's kindness because he believed that a hard head made a soft bottom. Back in the day, when I was growing up, there was none of this time out. Come on. <laughs> Some of our parents belong in jail. Come on, say amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> but we're better for it. Are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? But back in the day, you got a whooping. Because you may not have money, but you're going to have manners. You may not be rich, but you're not going to be rude. You may be poor, but you better be polite because everybody can say thank you. But we now live in a world that has been conditioned to be unthankful. This whole type of consumer mentality that the world lives by where we just take the attitude of entitlement. That people owe what they give to you has gotten out of control. Nobody owes you anything. And it's that same type of entitlement, that same kind of ungrateful mentality that we demonstrate towards God. That God owes me. That God needs me. That God needs to get excited because I come on Sabbath to worship him. That God must do for me. But let me tell you, God doesn't have to do a thing for me. In fact, if God doesn't do another thing for me, God has already done enough when he sent his son Jesus to die for me on Calvary. There should never be a moment in your life when you don't thank God for what he's done in your life. Has God been good to anybody? Has God blessed anybody? Are there 50 people up in City Temple who don't mind giving God thanks for what God has done? Paul says in everything. Give thanks in the good times, praise his name. In the bad times, praise his name. In everything, give the king of kings all the thanks. Let me tell y'all something. It is no test of faith to say thank you when the sun is shining. It does not create character when everything you touch turns to gold. When every idea is a stroke of genius, that won't make any faith for you. You see, it's easy to give God thanks when things are going well. It's convenient to be grateful when things are going great. When all is going well in your life, it is easy to say thank you. But Paul says, in everything, give thanks, which means even when things go wrong, thank God. When your world turns upside down, thank God. When sickness comes in your body, thank God. When death comes and enters your doorstep, thank God. When your enemies and foes come to eat of your flesh, thank God. When people talk about you, thank God, because now you know who your real friends are. 
When you've had a bad day at work, be thankful. At least you have a job. Some people don't. When you can't pay your bills, be thankful. At least you're not one of your bill collectors. When you're sitting in church next to that person who can't sing, be thankful because that means at least you're not deaf. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When you look in the mirror and you see gray hair, be thankful because there is a cancer patient taking chemotherapy who only wishes for more hair. When you find yourself waiting in a long line at the grocery store, be thankful. Think about the people who have no food at all. When you realize how much work it takes to keep a house, be thankful you have a house. When you feel like complaining because you got to walk a long distance from your car on Bonnie View Road to get into City Temple Church, be thankful because think of what it would be like if you couldn't walk at all. When you get irritated by other people's anger, apathy, ignorance, bitterness, or insecurities, be thankful because you could be one of them. When you think everything in your world is terrible and you want to give up, think of all the people who have been told that they only have a certain amount of time to live. Be thankful. So when hard times put you down, bad times knock you down, rough times hold you down. Thank God, because in everything, give thanks. Now, I love the way Ellen White puts it. She says in Ministry of Healing that even those things which appear to be against us, she said they may work out for our good. Because listen to me, this, I love this. I read this all the time because God, she says, would not ask us to be thankful for that which would harm us. All right, thankfulness is the opposite of complaining. I could complain, but I won't. I need to complain, but I won't. I used to complain, but now I don't. Because when I put my blessings on the side of my complaints, the balance of the scale is always tilted in my direction. Because my blessings far outweigh my complaints. I've had some good days. I've had some bad days. I've had some hills to climb. But when I look around and I think things over, all of my good days outweigh my bad days. I won't. <laughs> I won't complain. Listen to me, I'm almost done. The Israelites should have been more thankful than any other people in the Bible. But they were guilty of doing the most complaining. And like no other nation in scripture, they watched God move on their behalf. I'm not talking about what they heard. I'm not talking about the second generation who made it to the promised land. I'm talking about the generation that left Egypt. If there was anybody who should have been praising God and not complaining, it should have been the Israelites. Because the Israelites had seen God work miracles. They had seen God open up the Red Sea and deliver them from me, no Pharaoh. They had seen God release frogs and flies and lice to fight Pharaoh. They had seen the mighty hand of God defeat the most powerful army on the face of the globe. They had seen God make a Red Sea a dry highway. They had seen Pharaoh and 600 chosen chariots get drowned in the Red Sea. The Bible says it was so powerful that when Miriam looked back and she saw that man who had oppressed them, raped their women and beaten their sons, drowned in the Red Sea. The Bible says she grabbed a tambourine and she started beating that tambourine and she started dancing before God. And she said, God is a man of war. He's fought many battles. He's never lost one and Jehovah is his name. And then they marched through the wilderness for 40 years after the great escape, but God wasn't through with them yet. They had seen God turn the bitter waters of Marava into cool, calm waters from which they could drink. They had seen God heal through a brazen serpent that all they had to do was look on it and they were healed from all their diseases. They had seen God rain down manna from heaven, but not only that, their clothes never wore out. In fact, they had seen God, if you will, set up a dry cleaners in the desert because God kept them smelling good and looking good at the same time because there's no way you could be around the same folks for 40 years and every day with limited water and the same clothes on unless God provided for your progress. God kept their shoes from wearing out. 
40 years of walking and their shoes still looked good. And if anybody should have been praising God, if anybody should have been thanking God, it should have been the children of Israel. They should have never complained. But let's not be too hard on the Israelites. Because there are some Israelites up in here called black folk. Preach, Pastor Bird. I'm doing the best I can. If there is anybody who ought to be praising God, it ought to be people of color. You saw them put us in slave ships in the middle passage. You saw them have us chained up and dropped off and separated from our families. And then we want to get mad with each other and draw and argue with each other because we're from the United States and we're from Jamaica and we're from Trinidad and we're from Haiti. But the reality is we're all from the same place, Africa. We just got all dropped off on different shores. You saw them beat our men and rape our women. You saw those dogs, they stuck on our children. You saw those fire hoses, they turned on our children. You saw that bomb that went off on 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham and killed those four children. You saw them kill Emmett Till, murder Medgar Evans, and assassinate Martin Luther King. You saw them beat John Lewis at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. You saw them infect black men with syphilis, with the Tuskegee experiment. You saw them, the church, the Adventist church, deny Lucy Byard admission into the Washington Adventist Sanitarium only for her later to die at Freedmen's Hospital because they got her there too late. You saw them forbid black people from eating in the general conference cafeteria. You saw the back door. You saw the back of the bus. You saw the different water fountains. You saw Jim Crow segregation. You saw Bull Connor. You saw how they dehumanized us as a people. But through it all, through it all, God still brought us through. And you mean to tell me that you're going to sit down in church looking around at us, wondering what we're hollering about, wondering what we're shouting about, wondering what we're clapping about, wondering what all this noise is all about. I'll tell you what this noise is all about. I'm thankful. I said, I'm thankful. I said, I'm thankful because he brought us through. Do I have a witness in this place? He made a way out of no way. He did some things for me that I didn't even ask for us. So I'm gonna come here every time I get a chance in the temple. And I'm gonna rejoice over his goodness. Somebody said, if we haven't seen a president like you good, I'm gonna shout over his blessings. And I need somebody to join me who's not embarrassed to help me testify that God is a good God. That God is a merciful God. That God is a faithful God. That God is worthy to be praised. And if you don't want to praise him, I will praise him by myself. If I'm the only one in this church, if I'm the only one on my pew, if I'm the only one in this section, I'm going to lift my voice because I'm going to rejoice evermore. Because let me tell y'all, let me keep it real. I don't know when sickness is going to come my way. I don't know when trouble is going to come my way. I don't know when tribulation is going to come my way. I don't know when trials are going to come my way. I don't know when death is going to come my way. So while I have the chance, I say while I have the chance, I'm going to say thank you. Now, if the Lord has made a way for you, right now would be a good time for you to praise him. Because if the Lord has opened a door for you, Right now would be a good time to praise you. You put food on my table, thank you, Jesus. You put clothing on my back, thank you, Jesus. You put a roof over my head, thank you, Jesus. I got somewhere to sleep tonight, thank you, Jesus. You raised up my family and my friends, thank you, Jesus. Don't render evil for evil. Hug somebody, encourage somebody, rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give. Is there anybody here who knows what I'm talking about? I mean, really, is there anybody here who knows what I'm talking about? Jesus is a rock in a weary land. Shelter in time of storm. Friend when you're friendless. 
bread when you're hungry. He died, but on the third appointed day, he got up. Didn't he get up, y'all? I said he got up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In everything, give what, everybody? But listen, not for everything, but in everything. I'm not grateful for cancer, but I'm thanking him still in the midst of cancer. I'm not grateful for heartache, but I'm grateful, still thankful in the midst of heartache. I'm not grateful for the storm, but I'm still grateful in the midst of the storm. And brothers and sisters, here's the place where you ought to shout. Because you can shout your way through your problems. Somebody say, ought to say, God, you haven't made a way yet, but I believe you can. God, you haven't done it yet, but I believe you will. Because he may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. Quit looking at people funny when they're shouting. Quit looking at people funny when they're raising their hands. Stop frowning at them when they say amen. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know how they trusted in God. You don't know how God has made a way out of no way. You don't know what God has done. How dare you look at me funny? How dare you look at me crazy? God is my refuge and strength. A very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried to the midst of the sea, the Bible says, through, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the dwelling thereof, there is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High, because God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her. And she right early. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved, but he that keepeth thee will not slumber. Because he that keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from evil. He shall preserve thee thy soul he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty i will say of the lord he is my refuge my fortress my god in him will i trust so during this thanksgiving season we have a lot to be thankful for just to have life we ought to be thankful just to have breath, we ought to be thankful. Just to have a sound mind, we ought to be thankful. But I'm thankful for life. I'm thankful for breath. I'm thankful for a sound mind. But today I'm thankful for Jesus. I'm thankful for Jesus' blood. I'm thankful for Jesus' nail-pierced hands. I'm thankful for Jesus' nail-pierced feet. I'm thankful for, for Jesus' crown of thorns. I thank God that Jesus is coming back. I'm done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Stand and sing that with me, everybody.
take one Sabbath out of the year and say, thank you, Jesus. Just give you thanks. Thank you for our lives, our health, our strength, our families. We thank you for our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, our jobs, food. We thank you for this church. But Lord, we all thank you for Jesus. Because he died that we might live. We thank you for the promise that one day he's coming back. And so today we give thanks. Not merely for everything, but in everything. We give you thanks. Now, God, forgive us of our sins right now because there's a man, woman, boy, and girl who needs to give you thanks. And the best way they can give you thanks is to give you their life. So in the stillness of this hour, God, for that man, woman, boy, girl who wants to say thank you. And the best way they can say thank you, O Lord, is to give you their life. I pray that you would move and speak to them right now. Speak to them right now, God right now we pause in this prayer our heads are bowed our eyes are closed there's a man woman boy girl today you want to thank God for your life for your health for your strength you want to thank God for his sacrifice and the best way you can do that is to surrender your life to him I'm going to give you the opportunity to thank him in the best way you can by giving him your life and so I'm going to ask you you're saying Lord I want to surrender God, I want to thank you. I want to give my life to you today. Today, if that's you, I want you to come down front right now. I don't care what you did last night, last week, last year, Thanksgiving. I don't care, but God loves you. And today, you want to say thank you, Jesus. And the best way you do that, you want to give him your life. Today, if that's you, I invite you to come. The ice is broken. Someone has already come. God is calling you. God wants you. God died to save you. God is coming back to get you. Can you say thank you? Can you say thank you? Lord, thank you, God. Thank you, and I thank you by giving you my life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Today, if that's you, I invite you to come just as you are with all that you have and say thank you and surrender your life to the Lord Jesus. We're going to hang on just a little while longer, just a little while longer, a little while longer. Someone's coming. God loves you. He loves you. He will never stop loving you, but he, he wants you to say thank you. He deserves your thanks. And the best way you can do that is give your life to him. Today, are you here? Are you here today? I'm about to close, but I don't want to close this service without you giving your life to him. God bless you. God bless you, sister. God bless you. God bless you. It takes courage to come down here. It takes courage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I just want to. There's somebody else today. You want to surrender. You want to give it to God. You want to let it go. You want to say, Lord, thank you. And I thank you by surrendering and giving my life to you today. If you're here, I want you to come. But it's more than me wanting you to come. Jesus wants you to come. 
Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world will free? No, there's a cross for everyone. There's one for you and there's one for me. He loves you. And all he wants you to do is love him back. Now, I'm almost done. But you're worried about people. You're worried about what people are going to say. You're worried about what people are going to do or how they're going to think about you. None of these people in this church, nobody online, has a heaven or hell for you but Jesus. So while you yet can give your life to him and say thank you, I invite you to do it. Don't worry about people. You be worried about people and they be lost and, and you be saved. You need to make sure you're saved and not lost. Come on down this aisle today. Surrender. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seal the decisions of those individuals who've come to the front today saying, oh God, they thank you for what you've done. They thank you for sparing their lives. They thank you that God, when they thought about giving up, when they thought about waving the white flag, God, you stepped in on time and today they say, thank you. So seal the decision as they have come to the front to say thank you. They're coming saying they surrender their lives. They give their lives to you. So cover them, keep them. Trouble the hearts, minds, bodies, souls, and spirits of those online, even those in the building, who also, like these individuals, need to say thank you and surrender their lives. So God, as we gather this week with family, as we gather this week with friends, as we have fun, food, and football, God, may we never forget where all of our good things come from. That every good and perfect gift comes from you. And today we say thank you. We don't render evil for evil. We rejoice evermore. We pray without ceasing. And in everything we give you thanks. We pray this prayer. We ask these things. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say amen. Put those hands together, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God a hand of praise, everybody. Give a hand of praise. Weren't you blessed? I know I was. Praise God for his word. We want to remind you, Christmas Day, December the 25th, on NBC Television Affiliates, be sure to watch our Christmas television special, Come Adore Him. Come Adore Him, experience the word, and our entire media ministry, we need your prayers, but we also need your sacrificial charitable gifts to ensure that our media ministry and our television ministry continues. You may ask Dr. Bird, how do I do that? Number one, you can mail your charitable gift to us at Southwest Region Conference, 2215 Lanark Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75203. You can also share your gift via telephone. The number is 214-943-4491. Digitally, you can give via Cash App. Our Cash App handle is dollar sign SWRGC. Again, dollar sign SWRGC. You can also give online at our website, southwestregionsda.org. Follow the giving prompts and make sure you give your gift under Moving Southwest Forward. Finally, you can give your gift via Zelle. Give at swrgc.org. Give 
at swrgc.org. May God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time, same channel, as we experience the word.